you're back. Thank you so much. Uh, let's take a look at this other page here. There we go. So, impulse momentum theorem. Um, and I'm just going to box. I'll use a box this out right here. So this is important. I'm not sure, to be honest, how well you remember it. It's it's hard to gauge this year. Um, you know how much you'd remember about the change in momentum, delta P, is equal to mass times change in velocity. Uh, the net force times the time over which it acts. If it's a varying force, then we need to, because it's a little bit streamlined here, it, it would need to be average force, right, if there's a varying force. And the same thing with the torque for this one, too. I should have put those lines over there. If it's a constant force, <coughs> then that doesn't matter, you know, if the average is the constant value. And then, you know, of course, to make it seem fancy, the calculus version, if I give you a function of force in terms of time and we evaluate it between two times, that's the way we'd find impulse two. And don't forget, if I have a graph of force versus time, pen, um, you know, the area captured under that graph is the, the really the graphical equivalent of integrating. So we could, you know, see this and correlate it to if I have a force versus time graph that's, you know, doing something like this, we could chunk it out and find the area captured. That would equal the impulse. This should seem vaguely familiar. So all I am doing here is is trying to emphasize what the author didn't in chapter 11, that we can angularize this using that made-up word. I can you know try to convert this into a rotational analogy, where change in momentum now is change in angular momentum. It's uh, rotational inertia times uh, change in angular velocity. And you can see what I'm doing here, right? And I wanted to give you a little bit more some basic examples that the author doesn't give you too much of here. Um, and so that's what we're working on first, is with this first example here. If you haven't read it yet, pause and read it. Okay, so I'm giving you a, a function for torque in terms of time. So at any time t, this will tell you the torque in newton meters. And then I'm saying that this, there is this varying torque that's ask, acting on a simple large disk that has a rotational inertia of 10 kilogram meters squared. And if the disk starts at, at rest, use this information to find the, its angular velocity after four seconds. And so, you know, using this, right, we're going to be using, I'm sorry, let me, I'm circling the wrong thing. We're going to use this. I gave you a torque, and I told you between zero and four seconds. So we're going to take the antiderivative and do a definite integral between zero and four seconds and proceed from there, okay? And and that's that part's not bad. Like so, you don't really need me to do this with you. So that's good, right? Just pointing it out that that you can do it. So there it is, plugged in. There's the antiderivative, and there's the you know where I put the limits. I know this is not sort of the kosher way to do it for Miss Picaro's class. Um, and then this is me evaluating it. So it comes out to about 235 kilogram meter squares over seconds worth of change in angular momentum. And we haven't answered the question yet. All that did, did, all, all that did was tell us the change in angular momentum. They want the change in angular velocity. So we're going to use the other part. Do I have it still? Yeah, if we're going to use the other part of the, um, the impulse momentum theorem for angular. Now that we have a number for that, we're going to set it equal to this. And uh, right? So I'm setting it equal to that. And I can divide that 10 in to get the change in angular velocity, and since the stupid thing started off at rest, that shouldn't be too bad. So 10 goes into 235, 23 and a half times, right? So not so bad. Okay? So part B, find the average torque during that four seconds. I said this once, and you probably know this from being in calculus, but one of the, the big powers of, of integral calculus for just normal everyday stuff is if you have a function of something, something's varying in an unsteady way, it can be hard to estimate the average. So if you think about averaging things, it's a chore. You can set up a spreadsheet to do it, but it's going to be an approximation. This gives you an exact average. So since we now already have that definite integral, right, since this should be equal to average torque, I just divide the time over which that impulse was delivered, divide it in, and that will tell me the average torque. And it's just a quick little trick here. So I uh, see I added my little line above my tau here. So I'm just going to divide four seconds into that 235, and that tells me the true average, not an estimate of the average. So that's nifty. I'm just going to pause for it. OK, so this one is, is really kind of similar, but it's a graph. and It's a piecewise graph instead of a, um, 
uh, a function and uh, you're giving torque time time so you know make sure that you've got the the bare essentials of this do I still have my I do so you know the idea that's kind of built into this equation is when you see this that means if you have a graph of torque versus time the area captured under it is equal to another way to find the impulse or equal to the impulse I should say so and that's what we're gonna do for especially for part B um, for part A let's talk about part A first so um, when you think about something that's starting at rest and experiencing a positive torque, that means the thing is going to get spun up in the counterclockwise direction, so your perspective from the camera would be like that, so it's getting spun up, spun up. So even in this section right here between 10 and 20 seconds, even though that's a negative slope graph, that thing is still being sped up by that. It's just being sped up at a decreasing rate, but it's still being sped up. Um, so in terms of this graph and something that starts at rest, it's going to be speeding up, of course, here, and still speeding up here. And then right here at 20 seconds is the moment when the torque becomes negative and starts to slow it down, right? And so it increasingly slows it down, and then we get to a steady value from there on out. So the peak angular velocity will occur right at that point where it transitions from positive torque to negative torque. So the answer to this is 20 seconds. Uh, okay, so for part B, what we're going to do is we're going to use the area under the graph, which isn't explicitly on this equation, right? But we're going to just, you know, block out the area under this graph. At 30 seconds, we have to do positive area, smaller positive area, negative area, add those up, and that will tell us the cumulative impulse that's been experienced. And then we can set it equal to I omega, like similar to what we did with the uh, definite integral. So here we go. Okay, so there's my answer to the previous question. And so I've got this, like, you know, 20 times 10 is 200 um, a kilogram meter squared over seconds worth of, of angular momentum increase, and then another 100. And then this blue triangle here, this is negative, right, because this is below the axis. So uh, 200, 300 minus 50 is 250, right? 250 total change in angular uh, momentum. And, you know, again, just, you know, pasting this equation all over the place. So now we know this is equal to 250. So they gave us the I value. So I'm going to divide the 5 into the 250. And that will give me uh, 50. All right, yeah, 50 radians per second. So that's the answer to part B. Okay? Uh, for part C, what is the alpha at 5 seconds? So this is, I'm just trying to use this to review. So 5 seconds is right here where we have a nice constant torque. And don't forget, don't forget what? Don't forget torque net equals I alpha. So if, you know, this is describing the net torque, so I can find the alpha with this equation because we know the I now, right? And I know the torque is 20. So if the I is 5, so that's going to be 5. And this is 20 newton meters, right? So 5 goes into 24 times. So the angular acceleration is, is 4 radians per second, right? And where's that answer? There it is, right? So there's my work from last time I did this. Okay? And then at what time will it reverse direction? So in other words, let's go back. At what time will it reverse direction? So this thing started at rest here. It's speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, speeding up. And then right here it starts to slow down, slow down. And we've actually got, we know right here it's moving at 50 radians per second, right there at 30 seconds. So we can get this nice, steady, negative torque applied to it here. And so if we figure out the area between 30 and 40 seconds, let's put a little dotted line in there, it's 10 by 10, it's negative 100. So if you want to get to zero velocity, right, that's when it reverses direction. That means that we want our angular momentum to go back to zero. So at 40 seconds, we're taking another 100 away from our 250. Because right, we figured out for part B, it has 250 here at 30 seconds. So another 100, this will be 150. This will be another 100, so we're down to 50. So we'll need to go another 5 seconds to get to 0. So that means at 55 seconds. So the answer to D is 55 seconds. And we're just sort of wrangling the graph. Because these graphs are piecewise, um, yeah, 55, I just wanted to make sure I didn't misspeak. Um, you know, you have to just kind of figure it out you know, as you go. And we, it this, if this seems sort of familiar, I'm hoping it does. We did something very similar to this with uh, regular impulse. So I hope that helped. Thank you so much. If you're still watching, I appreciate your, your hard work. I do. I know it's, I say that a lot, but I do appreciate it. I get it. I get it.